I am Dr. Maria Espinola, and I am a clinical psychologist. In this channel, I share free wellness tips in English and Spanish. As I discussed in prior videos, I believe that engaging in social justice work can be a great way to promote your own wellness and the wellness of the communities you care about. And to discuss this topic with me today, I invited mental health influencer, clinician, and research scholar in psychology, Dr. Thomas Vince. What role do you believe psychologists can play in promoting equity and social justice? The roles that psychologists can play in equity and social justice is all roles. Uh, I think, you know, the power of being a psychologist, you get a chance to hit research and making research uh, uh, equitable, meaning that you speak from all different types of lens and calling out uh, your sample. Uh, a lot of folks, we don't really pay attention to sample. If we just say, you know, 98% of folks experience anxiety, and then we're like, well, let's break that down and actually see who is actually experiencing this and are you capturing all the voices? Uh, so that's one way, to make at least in research, that we can be more equitable in social justice. When it comes to practice, being culturally responsive, but not just you know, saying, oh, I'm culturally responsive because I, I work with the type of population, but really understanding and, and knowing uh, the awareness piece, the knowledge piece, the practice piece, and the policy piece of how to really utilize a cultural responsiveness to different populations and when to say that you are, you're practicing out of your, uh, your, your scope of practice. Uh, because a lot of folks are not really using that card, which is part of our ethical duties, is to alert folks, this is out of my scope. Uh, or unless you're getting enough supervision from somebody who can work with this particular community. And that is really important to me because, you know, we know that there's psychologists everywhere, but there's also, you know, areas that might not have a lot of diversity, racial diversity, sexuality diversity. So I'm thinking about rural areas, I'm thinking about native lands, I'm thinking about military spaces. Um, they might not have all the infrastructure in, in there, those spaces that can actually really act from a cultural responsive perspective. Uh, and then from my, my experience, I've been interacting with other you know, psychologists, it's being so rigid. Uh, in, in how they practice. So uh, if I want to do, you know, CBT, I want to follow my manual and I can't, you know, deviate off my manual uh, because this has been, you know, evidence-based practice and et cetera, et cetera. And that might not work for all clients. And it's really great and imperative that we listen and, and, and observe our clients, uh, understanding if they're, you know, maybe they're not just a high homework person. Uh, and we know that, you know, perspectives such as like CBT really home work driven um, you know we do our clients a disservice when we're not practicing from what they need instead of what we think that they need uh, I think those are two different concepts a lot of times we project oh this person needs this and, and that's that because all the research says this and it's like okay yes and also ask the client what they need uh, they might not need that you know ask them what works best for them uh, psychologists can really advocate in their social space and teaching um, you know, was, I remember uh, when I was teaching at the new school, I had multiple students come up to me and say, oh, you're my first black professor I ever had. And like, I was so happy just day one, just to sit in the class and looking over your syllabus and you put down all of these articles and books by other people of color. And I've never experienced that from my professor. Uh, the way that you talk and the way that you're just yourself uh, in class, it just makes me so, so inspired, makes me want to go into psychology. So just like my presence alone is, is I think is advocating, uh, is social justice, uh, just my existence. And uh, I, I hold true to trying to be my authentic self, which is why I call you know, myself a, a mental health influencer, which you know, that is, is not an official title or anything, but it's trying to normalize uh, the, the things that I learned from the ivory towers to everyday language. You know, what if people had access to, to knowledge around like, what exactly is social justice? Like, what exactly is equity? What exactly, you know, where can I go find help? Um, you know, what topics can I talk about in therapy? Because right now, uh, a lot of the rhetoric when it comes to communities of color, when you go see a psychologist, it means something is extremely wrong. Uh, that you're in crisis mode uh, and, and that you're hearing voices and you have like a major diagnosis and it's scary. 
Um, but if people forget that sometimes going to a psychologist is great for just vent, to just have space to just, just breathe. You know, imagine walking around life and you're constantly taking care of everybody else and you forget about yourself. But what if you had like an hour to just focus on just you? And then talking to somebody who looks like you or who understands your cultural background uh, and, we, and you don't have to work extra hard to try to teach the psychologist about your background. I, I think there's a lot of power in being aware of, of those spaces. I love it. Yeah, that, that is, yeah, that is so true. I love that you said that. I really like that you mentioned that just like by existing, you're basically advocating because that's like what I usually tell. So I have, so I co-founded the Latino Faculty Association at UC and I work with the Black Faculty Association too. And yeah, so I tell them, I mean, it's just sometimes by ex by existing. Yes, thanks. Uh, <laughs> like, yes, you are like creating a revolution. <laughs> bring it in that perspective. You know, a lot of people, you know, forget that, you know, yes, you have a racial difference, but that racial, race, racial identity brings in a lot of cultural identities and voice that is really, really needed. Um, even our dialect and how we say things. And I know I, I don't speak the most proper English and my students need to see that. My students need to see that, oh, I can just be myself and also be a psychologist professor at the same time. And I didn't know that. I thought I had to change who I, I, had, I was to fit what I thought academia was. And um, that part, I had to really do a lot of demystifying that, yes, be yourself. If you want to have purple hair, be have purple hair. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't do the job. You know, how can you show up as your full self? Because showing up as your full self is a way of self-advocacy. I love it. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> and tell me, uh, how did you decide to become a mental health influencer? I wanted to figure out ways to reach uh, people of my generation, millennials, Gen Z. Uh, I wanted them to see a black psychologist, like actually to say, oh, I know Dr. Vance. Like I see him, you know, in the stores or I see him at a restaurant. Uh, and have access to me. I think, you know, if they can actually point a person and have access to a person, you can shift the dialogue and, and how people see things. So it's kind of like Oprah, like we know Oprah, but that's like a, a person that we know we can't touch or we can't really get too close with. But imagine if you can talk to your neighborhood psychologist, you know, imagine if you can talk to them about everything and anything, you know, about, you know, pop culture, about what's going on in the news, about what's going on in your neighborhood or your friend groups and normalize mental health like it's an everyday haircut um, or going to the dentist and say, you know, oh, did you go see your therapist? Yeah. What did you learn in your therapy session? Oh, I learned, you know, about setting boundaries. And I'm always telling folks, you know, drink your water and mind your business and set your boundaries and protect your peace. Uh, and, and people think I'm just trying to be funny, but I'm like, you know, those are great tools that I use in my own life that sometimes we didn't learn uh, from our parents. And so if I can influence you to think more about your mental health, that is my goal. Uh, so I try to, you know, write and talk about mental health and get rid of all the psychobabble words that I learned in grad school and use every single day language. Um, because people might not understand, you know, what a psychiatric evaluation means, but they might understand, oh, when you go in and have your first session, uh, and, and the people are like, oh, that doesn't sound as scary. Um, having your first session compared to a psychiatric evaluation is, is the same thing, but they're, they're really different in language wise. Uh, I want people to learn and talk, you know, what exactly is anxiety? Is anxiety or what is depression? What is functional anxiety? What is functional depression? Like when we hear the word depression, we think of somebody who like, can't get out of bed and can't move. And, and there's lots of people who are experiencing depressive symptoms and are going to work and who are smiling, who are going out and, and partying still, and they're still depressed. And so what will happen if we can talk about things that happen in our everyday life um, that actually has a mental health slide to it. And then how do you choose your specialties? Multicultural issues, trauma, tell us about that. Yeah, I, I think a lot of us, we do a lot of research. Uh, and so for me, you know, as a, a Black man, uh, I didn't see a lot of Black men in psychology specifically. Uh, and I wanted to be a face uh, in the community that is open and talking about mental health uh, from a Black perspective. 
uh, because there's a lot of specific cultural challenges and topics that often don't get captured in the broad sense of psychology, uh, such as culture, such as even language and how we understand each other, uh, even those small micro expressions that uh, we express in the Black community that often get either overdiagnosed um, or not even talked about. Uh, which is also why I focus a lot on trauma, uh, because a lot of times, you know, when we talk about Black individuals, Black or African American, we don't catch trauma. Uh, we just instantly label as something anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, but we never do a great assessment or asking the right questions about trauma, cultural trauma, historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, uh, trauma that is learned, trauma from our environment, poverty trauma. Uh, food insecurities. There's so many different layers of trauma uh, that often get swept under the rug when it comes to Black individuals. Uh, so I focus a lot on trauma work uh, to really give that voice to really do a lot of training and talking in those areas. So tell us about your new role. That's really exciting. You're now a director at the Boys and Girls Club of America. Yes, yeah. So I am now the, the director of social services at the Boys and Girls Club of America here at the headquarters here in Atlanta, Georgia. So what I do is I focus a lot on trauma. Uh, I focus on trauma, I focus on safety, and I focus on our programs called Youth of the Year. Uh, I'm really making sure that all of our young people are supported from a trauma-informed perspective, making sure that they're not being uh, traumatized, making sure uh, that they are really supported. Uh, and the Boys and Girls Club have always had a trauma approach, but now we're actually really making it official and, and standardizing it to making sure that every club uh, is, is practicing from a trauma-informed perspective. So my role is to you know, develop a team, uh, you know, look at and create standards of practice, so what makes a trauma-informed organization. Uh, you know, filter that down from the big organizations down to local clubs, and also do a lot of staff training uh, to make sure that we're looking at trauma from a wide variety of perspectives. So not just physical and emotional, but we're looking at cultural trauma. Uh, we're focusing on a lot of in our minorities in all different spaces. So gender, racial, sexuality, religious, uh, because we have lots of clubs from our military base to our native lands to our so-called traditional clubs, which is what we will typically see in a typical neighborhood. And so each of those dynamics are so different. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are really trauma informed in all of those various spaces and to make sure that all staff and, and our youth are really feeling supported and feeling heard and making sure that uh, we are preparing and giving them the best chance that they can have. That's awesome. Okay, great. Yeah, and then, so so you get hired also for LGBTQ issues, right? To give presentations, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, especially last year, well, before the pandemic, I did a lot of talks on LGBT and, or uh, you know, trans, uh, like, how do you do the psychological process with trans folks, like evaluations? Because at Columbia, I was doing uh, like psych you know, evals before they go get medical transitions or just socially transition, talking with children and doing like evaluations from like youngest as like five. Uh, and, and work with our team from our pediatricians to our all of our surgeons who's all on a team in a collaborative way and uh, really making sure we give everybody the much support as possible. Uh, and that specialty kind of came out of CMTP it was never, I never in a million years thought I would be working with that particular population, but it wasn't until CMTP when I was at the Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery. And, and then my specialty was more like race and, and ethnicity. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, how can I put both of these together and look at it from an intersectional perspective? And do I know any black men who's going to touch trans into the non-binary folks uh, like professionally? And I, I couldn't name any black men. And I was starting to see a lot of uh, black uh, trans folks coming in. And I was like, well, wow. Like, uh, so, you know, part of me, I was like, well, I'm not part of the community. Um, but I do know the racial piece. Um, and, and so that was my, my bridge. And so I do a lot of work and try to pull on other communities who are part of the community to give me that lens as well uh, that I don't have and, and try to just elevate other voices. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, I'm an ally, right? So, um, and I, I mean, I've, I've been for human rights since I was very, so since I was like 11, because I was born in a dictatorship. So for me, it's more about like human rights plans. So it's just like, if you're human, you're good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
for advocacy. So I have, which is kind of rare because most people get stuck on one population. It's like, that's it. But that's yeah. very much the individualistic perspective of the United States. Yeah. <laughs> no, living in New York taught me the most about people. I feel like I grew the most there uh, because I saw so many different types of folks uh, just in, in the neighborhood from where I went. It just made me appreciate people even more uh, because I got a chance to learn like the nuances, even like within the black community and understanding like for myself, the difference between like race and ethnicities and let's really break it apart. And do you know that blackness is a lot larger than what I thought coming from South Georgia? Uh, and how, you know, everybody, there's a lot of folks who can be Black but can't be African American and everybody who's African American. So it's just, just really big and large and understanding, you know, the second largest population of Black folks is in Brazil um, after the continent of Africa. And I was like, wow, like nobody ever taught me that. Like I didn't know that. Uh, right. And so it really I grew a lot in learning about, you know, cultural, uh, just being responsive. So I think, well, I really like the fact that you focus on the transgender community yeah. and I feel like it's a, it's a very, very vulnerable community when it comes to suicide, self-harm, attacks, right, um, hate crimes. So um, particularly Black trans community, tra uh, transgender people of color in general, right? Um, so what can you tell us about what is it that needs to happen? to increase the safety and the love and the compassion and the acceptance from everybody. Absolutely. So when I was in New York, I did a lot of my research only looking at Black and Latinx trans women and their sexual history and development. Meaning, you know, what was their experience uh, being a trans woman, uh, Black experience or Latinx experience specifically, uh, and how did it change and develop across a lifetime? Uh, so, live, and especially living in New York City. Uh, so we know New York City is a big progressive city, yet there is still lots of safety concerns that people are having. Um, how people interact, you know, uh, job, trying to find jobs, you know, uh, sex work is work. Um, and also, it's also safety, you know, issues and how people, you know, are getting attacked and what to do and talk. So. What do we need to do? We need to involve those voices into our research. We need to involve those voices uh, into mainstream media. We need to involve those voices uh, and let them uh, lead and let us just be quiet and listen. Um, a lot of times when we hear uh, topics like this, it is what we think that the trans community need instead of asking what do you need and how we can just support and take the, the back seat. Um, and, and put our money where our action is. Uh, a lot of this funding, we're talking about homelessness, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, going to jail and being put in a male prison if you're a trans woman and, and you know, having access to your medical care and those experiences and those traumas. Uh, and then also people not knowing how to work with trans communities specifically without traumatizing them from clinician wise. Uh, and then also how to give support and our language. Uh, you know, the language is constantly evolving and shifting and changing. And what I have learned has been ask the person directly, you know, pronouns or uh, terminology that they use specifically um, instead of me just assuming, okay, yes, you're a trans woman, so I'm just call you a trans woman. I work with people who's like, well, I don't want to be called trans, just call me woman. And I work with people who is like, oh, it doesn't matter to me. Um, and so I've learned the most from asking them, letting them lead uh, and tell us what to what they need. And then also listen and put in action. A lot of times we like to listen and say, okay, but we're gonna bring you to you know, a seat at the table, but then that's pretty much it. We have to give more, uh, we have to really take a more social justice and equitable stance uh, and give folks what they actually need instead of trying to be equal. And so an example that I give to people all the time, you know, between equality and equity is, you know, if I give everybody in my classroom an extra small t-shirt, that is being equal. Um, but I possibly won't look the greatest in an extra small t-shirt. Um, but if I give everybody what they need, that is being equitable. Uh, and, and I think that's what we have to start, you know, leaning more on is how are we going to be equitable to certain communities that are being marginalized differently than uh, majority groups. Mm -hmm.